I believe this to be a very needful and rel relevant message for our time. As opposition increases, we also must increase so that we might stand through it. This is a message about the need for the word, particularly during the last days, and I believe we are living in those days and that the coming of Christ is near. I'm actually persuaded that this is nigh upon us, and I choose to preach with that in mind rather than preaching as if it were afar off. The following words are written near the end of Paul's life. In verse 6 of the same chapter, he says, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul, knowing his death is soon, gives the following charge to Timothy with upcoming events in mind, that being upcoming peril and the judgment of Christ. He starts by saying, I charge thee. Charge thee, as far as it's defined in the dictionary, it means to lay on or to give or communicate as an order, command, or earnest request to enjoin or to exhort. In the Greek, it means to adjure, which means to charge, bind, or command on oath or under the penalty of a curse. Paul charges Timothy to do the following, and the fact that it's a charge, though, shows it's a matter of great importance. You don't charge someone to just yeah. check the mail every day. <laughs> charge means this needs to be done without hesitation, no exception. Listen up when someone, when an apostle makes a charge. This is not only something that must be done without exception, but is something that must be done with great skill not casually or with little effort. He brings to Timothy's attention the presence of God in Christ. I charge thee before God in Christ, which shows that they are witnesses of what he is saying. This ought to provoke us to keep in mind that God and Christ, they listen to what we say. They're present as we speak. Also keep in mind that there is such a thing as the Lord departing from a person. So if God's there in your presence, that's like a sign that you're in favor. I say this with God present, he's approving of this, as well as a witness to it. When we speak for them, we have their attention, and if we say what they want us to say, they will undergird our message by the Holy Ghost and help us speak by helping our expression or revealing things to us. He mentions the judgment of the dead and of the living, the quick and the dead. That's what Christ is going to do at his appearing, judge. To me, this shows that Paul's knowledge of the coming judgment had an effect on what he said and did. Speaking in mind of that judgment, he earnestly exhorts and commands Timothy to make the most of his time and do the following. Because we know that in the end, we give an account for every word we speak. So how fitting a word to give, if the end is near, preach the word. That's what you want your speech to be filled with, the things of God. This is to be the main thing that you talk about. This is to be the focus of what you say. It is a good reminder of the impact of what such knowledge can have on what we say and do. And I'm sure if people were more aware of the upcoming judgment, they would most certainly live differently. I think people think this is a long ways off. They wait for all these signs to come and pass, which as far as I'm concerned, there's no guarantee that you're going to see them. But they are going to happen. But we can't live as if we can't use that as a guarantee. You've got to live like it's going to be today. It could happen today. Amen. If people were more aware that they would give an account for every idle word, they would speak differently if they had to give an account and explain why they did that or said what they did. If more people knew that every man would be awarded, rewarded according to his works, they would act and live differently. And Paul, he's a fitting example of how a person lives and speaks when they live in view of upcoming events that the Lord has spoken about. So here's what he charges them to do. Preach the word. Notice he doesn't say, win more souls, even though that does happen through preaching. He says, preach the word. He does not merely just tell him preach, but what to preach. Preach the word. Very specific. There's a specific message in reference here that must be preached without hesitation. Preaching is mentioned quite frequently in the scriptures, and in those various places, it's said what is preached. Some sections speak of preaching the word, like we do in our passage. Some say it's preaching the gospel, or they say preaching Christ, or preaching Christ and him crucified, or the gospel of Christ. Or even Jesus, he sent his disciples to preach the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus preached saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message to those around him. Now we'll say a word on just what it means to preach. Now in Greek, I found this word to mean to, mean, to be a herald, pro proclaim, publish in public with the suggestion of formality, gravity, and an authority which must be listened to and obeyed. That's good. 
In English, it says that to pronounce a discourse on a religious subject, but I don't list these as primary definitions, but just to show how limited an academic approach to the word can be. Amen. Even though I don't, just dis I don't dismiss dictionaries, but this shouldn't be your primary means of obtaining knowledge. When you consider what is preached, it should be all the more evident that preaching presumes that something's been accomplished. Something is done. That's, that there's something done that needs to be heard or declared. The message we often declare is what the Lord has done through Jesus Christ, hence gospel of Christ, preaching Christ. These expressions are in scripture. Christ has done much for us. He still does much for us today. And the fact that Christ rose from the dead and accomplished his work on earth makes preaching effective. This is all the more evident when scripture says if he had, not, if he had died and not rose from the dead, your faith is vain and your preaching is vain if Christ is not raised. But he is raised, therefore the yeah. preaching now has power. Yeah. There is something to say that can benefit humanity. Mm -hmm. However, preaching is not merely giving an overview of the life of Christ, taking like a historical approach to his life and accomplishments, but expounding on the results of his work and making known who he is and what he is doing. That's things that are made known in preaching. Preaching is not just telling people Jesus died, but why he died and what happened as a result of it. Preaching isn't just saying Jesus is raised, but expounding on what happened as the result of it and why he lives and what he is doing now, now that he is risen. By preaching these things, we also tell of others that what we must do in order, for, in order to receive God's grace. Unbelievers repent at the preaching of the gospel. Men believe when the gospel is preached. Men know how to live for God when the gospel is preached. Men cease from sinful activity. When the gospel is preached, all these, when these things aren't taking place, it's questionable if the word's being preached at all. Men need to understand not just knowing what to say, but how we know what to say. Today, there's a large focus on academia, like dictionaries, lexicons, college degrees, you know. We don't condemn these things. But men seem to not understand that the message that we preach comes from God, not from our own imaginations or our own efforts. In the scriptures, you read things like handling the word of God or rightly dividing the word of God. He's not talking about using word studies or learning different languages when he says that. Here's a passage that comes to mind on this. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, it says, But as is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us yeah. by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. There is such a thing as spiritual understanding. And it's, it's said that way, spiritual understanding, then that should make it evident where the understanding comes from. What do you think it means when the Bible says we have understanding? It says that in the scripture. It says we know the Son of God has come and he's given us an understanding. He gave us the understanding. What do you think that means? Does it mean we're fluent in Hebrew and Greek? Is that what Christ gives us? Does it mean that we know the definitions to all the words? Does it mean that this understanding comes from the Lord? It doesn't come from human research. Amen. The Bible says that if any man lack wisdom, he shall read a commentary. If any man lacks wisdom, he shall pull a dictionary off the shelf. Or if any man lacks wisdom, he shall learn another language. No, no, and no. This is not what the scriptures say. It says, if any man like wisdom, he shall ask of God, and it shall be given him. Who gives to all men liberally? Perhaps this is also a part of why the gospel is not being commonly preached in our time. Because men are obtaining wisdom from the wrong source. If men are having trouble understanding a spiritual truth or it's hazy, they need to go to God. Not to the Greek. I personally haven't learned anything new studying the Greek. That's just my experience. Do what you will with that. For the sake of not being under, misunderstood, I'm not saying, like, don't read your Bible. It'll just come to you. We understand the things that we do by reading what, the, what has come through the Spirit, and the Spirit has put these things in writing for us. These things are inspired. Mm -hmm. By looking at what God has revealed, that's how we learn. That's how we understand the will of God. That's how we understand how to live righteously. That's how we understand what God is doing and how we must prepare for what's coming up. But we don't obtain understanding these things by just looking at what men think it means yeah. or looking at a man's wisdom. That's what I'm meaning here. My point is that when Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, he's telling him to preach what the Lord's revealed to him, right. 
What the Lord's opened up, what the Lord gave you, that's what's being preached. Not what you came up with, what God gave you, what God showed you. That's what he says, speak. Speak those things. Those of us who have had great and profound things from the word opened us to opened up to us, don't hesitate to speak these things. You have a charge. Speak. Preach. Show these things to us. If God reveals it, it must be declared, not kept secret. Which brings us to the next point. He adds this. He says, be instant in season and out of season. To be instant in this case would be constant in this duty, preaching the word. Take every opportunity to make known the gospel. It also means to be urgent and wholly give yourself to the work, not lacking in any way or showing any casualness, like you're full time. And the text says to be instant in season and out of season. For something to be done in season would mean when things are convenient or when things are favorable. Done without hindrance or obstructions. It could also mean during regular or stated times. So this is times like today we have set times where we're going to meet together and we're going to speak the truth. And learn and speak from the word. Out of season then would have to mean that when it's not convenient. Or where there are hindrances or even risks of resistance or embarrassments. This would be like saying, don't just preach when you're scheduled to. Today, this is most certainly not happening in the church. It takes boldness, courage, and aggression to be able to act on these words. It's easy for men today to preach when things are convenient and then clam up when there's any kind of oppression or controversy over the truth. This is also an exhortation to keep at the word, even if things get difficult. And this is something that's really been helpful to me personally, knowing that this is something I've had to overcome in the past, is a lot of people start up ministry, start up works, and they have a strong start, but then after a while they run out of gas, and then the work just dies out. That's not what this passage is talking about. That's a contradiction of what he's saying here. That's being instant in season only. When things get hard, you don't want to work anymore. You don't want to talk anymore. This is not right. This is not something that we are to practice or continue in. If we only preach and expound and grow in things only when it's easy to do so, then you will likely make little to no progress. With that in mind, those of us who minister and preach, keep this truth in mind and stay strong and keep your hand to the plow. That means don't let go of it. That means keep using it when we say that. And not just doing it and then just like letting go when things get difficult, taking your breaks. He adds to reprove, rebuke, exhort with long suffering and doctrine. These are things that we can do in preaching. Mm -hmm. Reprove is to convince, that is, win over by argument. In this case, the argument would be based or built on the word of God. This would cause the other party to see the error of whatever it is that's being reproved. Rebuke is to point out error, chide, or reprehend for a fault. If men are in error, they must be corrected. And if men do not abandon their sin, they must be chided or warned of the consequences of such foolishness. Exhort involves moving a person to do what is right. When we hear the word, or those who hear the word and they respond to it, there must be effort to exhort that person to provoke him to act on what he's heard, act on what he's been told. And this is something that we are seeing done regularly in our assembly. Continue in that. Continue. Long-suffering, I believe, applies to the all three things mentioned above. Long-suffering is forbearing affliction or pain in view of something happening. This is a good reminder to, pre to preach with a patient and preserving spirit, even when opposed. Continue in these things, even if the response is not favorable, in view of the person embracing what is taught. Doctrine in, is teaching, and we're long-suffering while we reprove, rebuke, and exhort. However, to me, this, invo this involves what we do these things with. We do them with doctrine. We use the teachings of the scriptures to reprove, rebuke, and exhort others and each other. If doctrine is not in what we say, and we will accomplish very little for the Lord, and our words won't do much work. There has to be something in the scripture. That has to be your foundation of why you do these things. Amen. Now, while doing all these things, we're brought to this other part in verse 3 where it says, for the time will come. Like this is kind of like, this is something he's thinking of while he's giving this charge. He's thinking in view of this. Primarily, I believe this is talking about the perilous times that was mentioned in the same letter in the third chapter. He says, perilous times shall come. I believe that's what's in reference here. In his first epistle to Timothy, he wrote that in latter times, many would depart from the faith and give heed to seducing devils and doctrines of demons. And in his second epistle to the Thessalonians, he said a great falling away would take place before the day of Christ. 
Now what I'm gathering from this is that as the time of our Lord Jesus' return draws nigh, oppression's going to pick up. The heat's going to turn up. The devil knows his time is short, so it makes sense that his efforts to destroy the saints increase as the time runs out. He gets more angry. I don't have much time left. I have to do more. I have to make more effort to overthrow these saints of God. Things are going to get so bad that anyone who's not grounded firm and, the, and strong in faith, they won't survive it. All the people that are fake and fickle and not serious, they'll fall right off. They'll run away like cowards. They won't want to hear it anymore. They'll conform and change to fit with the enemy. They fall away because they can't take the pressure. They will run because they're not strong enough to resistance. Dark times are coming. This is not a time to be slacking on the job. <laughs> I also believe that these days are soon to be on us, if not on us already. I mean, you consider what's going on now. I mean, it just seems to fit. The remainder of our passage has led me to this conclusion. It says men, they won't endure sound doctrine, helpful doctrine, doctrine that's good for the soul. In our day, men seem extremely uncomfortable at the sound of the truth. Men not willing to subject themselves to the word for long periods of time. It even what they do subject themselves can't really be cl classified as God's word. I'm sorry, you're not going to get to heaven going 15 minutes hearing about problems. You're not going to get to heaven hearing 10-minute discourses on how to win souls. Sorry, there has to be more. There has to be better things offered. Entertainment is rising, distracting men from the work of the Lord. People in the church are embracing doctrines and practices that are contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Ignorance of the word of God is increasing by the day. Division among saints increasing by the day. Churches today fire ministers for preaching the word instead of not preaching what the people want to hear. This is things that are go these are things going on right now. And when you look at that, and then you read this passage, you think, well, these times are coming off on us pretty rapidly, which means the coming is very, very close. With these things going on around us, I can't see how one can conclude that the latter times of reference are at least very near, if not here. It says they have itching ears. Itching. Referred to desires to hear certain things preached. These people will turn... From the truth and embrace fables, other versions they say strange stories, myths, folklores, and one, even though it's not the best translation, it says stupid fantasies. They gratify their lust with these things. They will heap up teachers that only preach what they want to hear with no interest in the truth or the God who gave it. An itch is an irritation. An ir something that causes you to, like if you have an itch, like something that would satisfy would be scratching it. And so... In this case, their ears are itching to hear what they want to hear. And so if the ear is itching over that, then hearing what they want, hearing things that gratify their lust, this would like ease the itching of their ears. But if that's, if that's true, if this eases it, then the truth irritates the ear. And they hear the truth, you know, it's like, oh, I don't like this. It's irritating. Get some restless, angry. When you get irritated, you get angry. You get upset. You get short. <laughs> And so this is their means of addressing that situation. Turn away from the truth. Get rid of those who speak it. And let's fill the pulpits with people who say what we want to hear. That's a much more comfortable situation for us. Since messages that cater toward the lust satisfy the ears, hearing the truth, it's only going to irritate. Hence, itching ears. And with such perilous times up ahead, Paul charges Timothy to take every opportunity to preach the word. When the latter times come... In reference here, it's going to be more difficult to preach the word, seeing there's going to be a great deal of oppression, great deal of resistance. Men, they're not going to put up with it. They're not going to tolerate it. A lot of tolerance talked about in our country. Well, they're not going to tolerate this. You'll never hear on the radio saying, we need to be more tolerant of those preachers. We need to be more tolerant of those Christians. Let them be against sodomy. Let them be against adultery. Let them be against messages that don't provoke godly living. Let them. Let's like start a let's let's start up a campaign about them. Like you know, let's like get a vote. You'll never ever hear that said in America. They're past that point. If you're thinking that's going to happen, forget it. Give up. Be realistic. While there is time to preach without restraint, do it as much as you can and make the most of your time. Make the most of the time you have, while it's the, while things are the way they are. Don't let any opportunity pass you by. And the Spirit, you know, just to mention, the Spirit doesn't bring these things up to discourage us. 
Because people can read things like this and be very downcast that such resistance is coming, such affliction. But these things are mentioned to provoke us all the more to preach the gospel. That's the design of it. You have to think of it in terms of, like, many, some ministers have, when you know, read commentaries, they came to this conclusion. I think it's fitting. It's like, well, if we desist, the gospel's just not going to be preached. If it's that intolerable, if it's that hard to hear, how much damage are we doing not speaking it? That's just, that's just the way I choose to think on it. It's all the more important you speak the truth during times like this because the truth isn't going to be preached much. It's not preached much now. But it's going to get worse on top of the way it is now. In addition to the truth not being preached, people will have no tolerance for the preaching of the gospel and make effort, they'll actually make effort to snuff it out. They'll try to shut it down. This is why we're told, be instant out of season. Because if, you, if you're in this mode where it's only, only when it's convenient, then there's going to be a time where it's going to seem never convenient. That makes this all the more necessary. Become an expert in handling things under pressure. Being able to preach while there's resistance. All the apostles did it their whole lives. Jesus did it too. People tried to shut Jesus down. People tried to refute what Jesus said, bring down what he said, make a fool out of him. But he, that didn't stop him from speaking, did it? Amen. He shut plenty of their mouths, though, didn't he? Amen. They didn't come at him over and over again. In another sense, this thought came while reading the passage, we must subject ourselves to constant declaration of the gospel because of the aggressive efforts of the enemy. During the latter times, men will be turned to fables, which shows there's going to be many false teachers promoting lies. And these people can turn people. Those who are not grounded will turn. Christ spoke of false Christs and apostles and prophets that would deceive many. Paul spoke of men lying in wait to deceive. How many times have the apostles said, let no man deceive you? <laughs> they, so, I mean, they're, aware, they're plenty aware there are deceivers out there. Yeah. And even then, Paul spoke of seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, which, you know, that's the source of the false teacher. That's where they're getting their false doctrines from. It's not something they just came up with. Demons, yeah. devils, yeah. seducing spirits. Seduce, that's a word that's like, no one thinks anything good when you hear seduce. But, they're very, but they always like, draw you in with intent to do damage through preaching many are men are ready to resist lies and false doctrines that grow around them if men are not taught well in the word of god they will be overtaken when the truth is not tolerated our nation today men are compromising the truth because men are not showing any tolerance for it that's their cause they're backing away from these hot topics that the world says well that's the way it needs to be and the church says okay well, this isn't right. This is not how the church is said to even operate in the scriptures. They say, well, that's not right. We say, yeah, yeah it is right. And we're going to keep talking about it. We're not changing. You change. That's God's command. They're changing their message to keep those who hate the truth off their backs. Don't allow yourself to be that kind of a preacher. Don't compromise the truth. Don't back away. Don't change it. Don't cater it to the interests of those who are weak and not interested. Amen. Cater it for those who love the Lord. Amen. Speak to those. Draw them out of wickedness. There you go. I conclude by admonishing all who hear not to back away from preaching or speaking the truth. To be bold. Mm -hmm. Do not hesitate to speak. And be of good courage because the Lord is with you in these labors. Yeah. That's something I think a lot of people seem to forget. Uh -huh. How could you back away something that God is in with you in? Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. If the Lord says he's with you, I'm with you always, I won't leave you or forsake you, I'll be there with you in the, in the affliction, and he would, they, they wouldn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there's a man there in the fire with them. Mm -hmm. With them. Uh -huh. And then they say, I'm going to give up now. Hmm. While God's by your side? <laughs> this is, see, they, they have forgotten that truth. That's right. They've forgotten that you're not in this on your own efforts. Amen. You're not even preaching your message. It's God's message. And so with that awareness, I mean, even Paul, he's, he's well aware of the presence of God in Christ. He made the charge before God in Christ. And we speak in their presence. I encourage you to continue in what you're doing, grow in what you're doing, and as things get worse, you get better. Amen. And the Lord can help us preach with greater skill, which I do desire to do. 
who will have the exhortation?